uh, talked about, Congress recognized that changes in the, important, in the appointment of the IGs would enhance their independence. As we've noted in prior reports and testimony, independence is one of the most important elements of an effective IG function. Professional auditing standards, generally accepted government auditing standards, GAGAS, that were issued by the Controller General, recognize that audit organizations located in government entities, including IGs appointed by their agency heads, can meet the requirement for organizational independence. Much of the IG Act provides specific protections for IGs to ensure that the audit and investigative functions located within the agency being reviewed is insulated from inappropriate management pressure. However, the difference in the appointment and removal processes between presidentially appointed IGs and those appointed by their agency heads results in a clear difference in the level of IG organizational independence. In this regard, I think we would all agree with the common sense proposition that the further removed the appointment source is from the entity to be audited, the greater the level of independence. And I think the flip of that is similar with respect to the removal authority. The recently enacted IG Reform Act of 2008 amends the IG Act to further enhance the independence of the IG. The agency appointed IGs will now be required to be selected without regard to political affiliation and solely on the basis of integrity and defined abilities, just like IGs appointed by the President. In addition, the Reform Act enhances the independence of the IGs by requiring notification to the Congress of the reasons for an IG removal or transfer at least 30 days prior to any such action rather than after the fact notification. The Reform Act also created the Council of IGs on Integrity and, and Efficiency to replace the administratively creative councils uh, that governed the presidential uh, appointed IGs and those that were agency heads. The new IG Council is expected to aid the IG community and foster government-wide efforts to coordinate and improve IG oversight. Currently, considerable debate is underway over whether and how current financial regulatory systems should be changed, including calls for consolidating regulatory agencies, broadening certain regulators' authorities, or subjecting certain products or entities to more regulation. A strong, independent, and coordinated IG oversight and accountability function should be an important element of this reform. At the end of my statement, I'd be happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. We are attempting, as you have heard, to really improve the efficacy of this particular position. Is there anything else that you would suggest to make this a more independent agency and a more reliable one? Because it's all going to come down with uh, your evaluations and your recommendations. So what are we missing that you would like to see? We have approached the issue also uh, from a slightly different perspective. A number of the uh, uh, IGs, uh, CFTC, um, uh, uh, CC, I think they're relatively small in size. And another approach would be to consolidate those audit functions in Presidential, existing presidentially appointed IGs. Uh, we had uh, uh, offered uh, the concept before that you could uh, make CFTC and SEC part of the Treasury IG and the NACUA uh, part of the FDIC IG's office and Penny Benny as part of the Department of Labor IG office. Those were all presidentially appointed IGs. We had in the past recommended that the IG at the Federal Reserve be presidentially appointed because of the significance of the functions and the activities of that agency and its size. What bothers me is the politicizing of the IG reports and also the fact that the ideology from the administration is part and parcel of the IG's function and office. So when you say political appointment, how can we guard against politicizing that particular position and uh, the ideology that that person 
might carry that lines itself with the president? It, uh, uh, I'm a lawyer. I, I, I approach things as a lawyer. I would note that both with respect to the DFEs as a result of uh, uh, your colleague, Mr. Cooper, and uh, Senator McCaskill's efforts, uh, the, the, the DFE IGs, those that are agency head appointed, uh, they're now supposed to be appointed without regard to political affiliation and solely on the basis of integrity and the defined uh, abilities that would be relevant to an IG. That has been the law with respect to presidential IGs since uh, 1978. It was made explicit for DFEs in 2008. Uh the turmoil that we're in at the current time and uh, the fact that uh, we're at a crisis unseen before, maybe even worse than it was in the end of the 20s and the 30s. And my concern is that the IG report be absolutely impeccable and represents the facts as are found. Uh, is there an evaluation component that we can add in that might help? I know you do recommendations at the end of your reports. Uh, I am the general counsel in an audit organization, and I, I agree with you 110%, um, uh, Madam Chair, that the objectivity and the credibility of the audit organization is its most important asset. Uh, and we at GAO are very, 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 very uh, 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 protective of our objectivity and credibility. With respect to the, the uh, IGs and the audit communities, there is now the Council uh, of IGs for uh, Integrity and Efficiency that is, has an integrity committee that looks at wrongdoing amongst the IGs. There are also uh, peer reviews of their organizations and their activities. I believe it's a three-year cycle. Three -year. On a three-year cycle, um, and, uh, and and you know that should go a long way to ensuring the the quality of the work of the uh, auditors. Thank you for that. I'd like to announce the presence of uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spears who hails out of California, one of my colleagues many, many years ago in one of my other lives. Welcome to the committee, and I welcome your presence here. And would you like to address Mr. Klippinger and, uh, with questions? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm honored to serve on this committee uh, with you. Um, Mr. Keplinger, I, I couldn't be more uh, in agreement with you, maybe more violently so, uh, than you have already expressed. I believe strongly that the inspector general function in this country has to be uh, made stronger and more independent than it is right now. And I would agree with you that we should get rid of the agency appointed inspector generals. Um, I, I read in the analysis, uh, Madam Chair, that uh, there have actually been examples where recent investigations of IG offices at the National Aeronautic and Space Administration and the Department of Commerce have, have raised some concerns because there just is a closeness that exists when you are actually appointed by that entity. And it, it brings to mind a case in California, I believe after you left, where there was horrendous problems in the Department of Corrections. And the investigations unit at the Department of Corrections was not operating properly. And I carried legislation to create an inspector general uh, that was independent of the department, that was appointed by the governor for a specific time frame. So if the governor didn't like the kinds of inspections or the reports that the inspector general came up with, that would not uh, prevent the inspector general from continuing to be in office. So um, I do applaud that kind of an approach. I think we really should get rid of the appointed uh, inspector generals from the departments. Uh, I'm curious, Mr. Keplinger, what your uh, feelings are about uh, term limits and, or at least a, a fixed term, I should say, and you, know, you, can, you can bleed 
a particular agency or starve, I should say, a particular entity um, by just not giving it enough resources. So how do you guarantee the independent funding of an inspector general's office that's adequate to do the job? Mr. Spear, there's, a, I think, about three questions in there, and hopefully my memory will permit me to answer all three. Uh, first, with respect to the issue of the appointment, um, you know, it's a two-sided coin, independence. Uh, to a certain extent, once appointed, um, uh, you're, and you have the position, your real concern is more often focused on who can remove you. Right. And, the, and my point has been the further removed you are from the entity you're auditing, the more independent you're going to be. So I think we're in uh, violent uh, agreement, maybe not mob violent, but violent agreement. With respect to the issue of term limits, the IGs are, uh, in, I think, uh, fairly characterized as uh, executive branch employees. Term limits that uh, limit the president's authority to uh, OE and to remove uh, could pose uh, significant issues in terms of uh, the, the executive's authority. Um, there are, uh, well, certainly uh, the Controller General, who has as a unique uh, position, and other legislative uh, Article I entities like the Court of Claims have term positions. There's only a few. Uh, executive, well, the one executive branch uh, position that has a term that I can think of is the director of FBI. And that is because of the desire, and I think it's a political accommodation, not necessarily a legal one, but it's a political accommodation between the two branches that the FBI's need to be independent, credible, and objective in its investigations and enforcement actions, uh, uh, if you will, argue in favor for a term limit. I think it's a seven-year term uh, for the director of the FBI. Now, you had one other question, uh, and, uh, and it is escaping my memory at this point. I was happy to see people up here with the purple banners uh, in favor of Alzheimer's, but because uh, at times I feel like early uh, stage dementia. But if you can remember your third question, I had a response for it. Uh, it the funding issue, how you can starve uh, an inspector general's office uh, as a way of putting them out of business. Well, I would uh, commend uh, again uh, Mr. Cooper and uh, Senator McCaskill because in the 2008 Reform Act, a process was put in place to make the IG's articulation of their funding needs transparent through the budget process. But that, that still could, uh, let's say an inspector general is doing very good work, but is embarrassing an administration. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget for that office could be reduced in a way that would then limit the ability of that inspector general to do his or her job. Under the Reform Act, the IG's comments of their funding needs is part of the president's budget uh, when submitted uh, for the IG's account. So it has transparency and, uh, uh, and presumably would be a matter for the appropriations process to deal with what is the right amount. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would like now to go to our member from California, Mr. Duncan. Would you? Oh, excuse me, well, Tennessee. Right. <laughs> the two of us are well, Californians. I, I, I will tell you that uh, uh, Duncan Hunter and I used to yeah. always get, be mixed up uh, with each other, so that's all right, Madam Chairman. Just a couple of questions since I just got here. Uh, let me ask you, Mr. Keplinger, is there any, are there any powers that uh, a presidentially appointed uh, IG has that other inspector generals do not have? No, generally I think they have the same uh, scope of authority. All right. There's a few exceptions, um, uh, but, uh, even those exceptions cut across presidential appointee and agency head appointees. All right. And I've noticed that uh, uh, with the exception of the top cabinet members, it sometimes takes an awfully long time to get to people appointed like U.S. attorneys and so forth. It seems that they put them through a uh, needlessly lengthy investigations of 13 or 14 months sometimes. Do, how, how long has it generally taken to get a presidentially appointed IG into office, do you know? Uh, off, no, I, off the top of my head, I do not know. All right. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Dr. for coming. And uh, I have one more question, and uh, it's a short one. Do we have enough protection in the law? For whistleblowers. Uh, my response is yes, um, and, the, and I haven't, uh, Madam Chair, made a study of this except in one regard. Um, legislation uh, passed in the last Congress uh, established a statutory IG in uh, GAO. This was the first for us. And in the process of doing that, we transferred the whistleblower protections uh, from, that are currently in place for the uh, IGs into our own statute and made them applicable for our employees and our IG. Uh, at the time, my sense was that those were really quite adequate, um, and, but leaving open the possibilities that there's always an opportunity for improvement, uh, my general response would be yes, I think they are adequate. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I, I don't say that with one, uh, excuse me, a heck of a lot of, of uh, uh, confidence in prior review of that issue. Okay? The committee would like to thank you for your time and the information you have shared with us, and thank you very much. My your pleasure. Patience. Thank you very well, much. You My, thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, now time to turn to the third and the last panel. And if they come up to the table, I'll swear you in. Right now, in recess for a couple of minutes while the current witnesses uh, come to the table. I would uh, like all of you to stand because it's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And uh, all of you are in place now. Would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record uh, reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I would now like to take a moment to introduce our panel. And before we begin, I will note uh, for the record that Ms. Elizabeth A. Coleman, the Inspector General of the Board of Governors and of the Federal Reserve System, was invited to testify today but was unable to join us. She did, however, submit a statement for the record. Without objection, we'll enter that in the record. First, I would like to introduce Mr. H. David Coates. He is the Inspector General of Securities and Exchange Commission. There he conducts audits and investigations of both agency functions and self-regulatory organization activities. Prior to his service at the SEC, he served as the Inspector General of the Peace Corps and as Assistant General Counsel. The next is Mr. William DeSarno. He is the Inspector General of the National Credit Union Administration. There, he developed his office's first strategic plan and oversees including planning, budget, and staffing issues. Mr. DeCerno began his NCUA career in 1997 as Assistant Inspector General 
for audits and was named Inspector General in 2005. Then there's Mr. A. Roy Lavick. He is the Inspector General of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. He has over 25 years of federal experience primarily in the area of antitrust and regulatory law and has received in his current and has served in his current position since 1990. Prior to his time at uh, CFTC, he worked as both the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Trade Commission. And next we have Vanessa K. Burroughs, a legislative attorney in the American Law of the Congressional Research Service. There she serves as an issue expert on matters relating to inspectors general throughout the government. And then Mr. Clark Kent Irvin, Clark Kent, I love that. <laughs> Mr. Clark Kent Irvin, uh, the director of the Aspen Institute's Homeland Security Program. He joined the Institute in 2005, and before doing so, he served as the first Inspector General of the United States Department of Homeland Security from January 2003 to December 2004. Prior to his service at DHS, he served as the Inspector General of the United States Department of State and the Broadcasting Board of Governors. And finally, Ms. Danielle Bryan, who serves as the Executive Director of the Project on Government Site, or as we call it, POGO, P-O-G-O, a nonprofit, nonpartisan watchdog organization that works with whistleblowers and government insiders to expose corruption, fraud, and abuse of power. She began her career with POGO in 1986 and has degrees from Smith College and John Hopkins University. I will ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary, if you can, under five minutes in duration. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. And so we'll start now with Mr. Coates. Please proceed. Cuts. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today before the subcommittee as the Inspector General for the Securities and Exchange Commission. My testimony today, I'm representing the Inspector General, and the views I express are those of my office, do not necessarily reflect the views of the Commissioner and the Commissioners. The mission of the Office of Inspector General is to promote the integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness of the critical programs and operations of the SEC. This mission has become increasingly important in light of the current economic crisis facing our nation. My philosophy as an Inspector General is to focus on the significant issues and high-risk areas, i.e. looking at big picture items relating to whether the programs and operations in the agency are working effectively, rather than simply identifying isolated minor infractions or procedural violations. I believe that this approach is particularly important in light of current market conditions and the significant challenges facing the SEC and other governmental agencies that regulate our financial markets. I believe it is more important than ever that financial regulatory agencies such as the SEC have an independent, effective, and fully funded Office of Inspector General to assist the Commission in confronting these challenges. I'm proud to report that over the past 14 months that I've served as the SEC's Inspector General, our office has risen to these challenges and then some. Notwithstanding a small staff, we have issued numerous audit and investigative reports discussing issues critical to SEC operations and the investing public and making significant recommendations for improvement. Many of these reports have been critical of SEC operations, programs, and management, and I have not always been the most popular individual at my agency. Nonetheless, I feel it is my duty to the Commission the Congress and the investing public, particularly in these challenging times, to conduct independent audits and investigations and to issue thoughtful, unbiased, and frank reports. I'll provide you just a few examples of recent activities undertaken by my office, some at the request of, of congressional committees. In September 2008, our audit unit issued a comprehensive report analyzing the Commission's oversight of this SEC's Consolidated Supervised Entity, CSE program, which included Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers. 
the audit identified significant deficiencies in the CSE program and provided 26 recommendations to improve the Commission's oversight of CSE firms. In response to the report's findings, former SEC Chairman Christopher Cox announced the end of the CSE program and promised to review and move to aggressively implement the report's recommendations. The Office of Inspector General's unit also issued a second report during that same time period, analyzing the Commission's broker-dealer risk assessment program and made several recommendations to improve that program. More recently, my office has issued several other significant audit reports. In February, we issued an audit report that analyzed the $178 million in disgorgement waivers that the Division of Enforcement had granted between October 2005 and May 2008. We found that proper procedures were not always followed in recommending these waivers and provided several recommendations designed to improve the process. Just last week, we issued a comprehensive audit report on enforcement's practices and procedures for responding to and processing naked short-selling complaints. Our report concluded that enforcement's existing complaint receipt and processing procedures hinder its ability to respond effectively to naked short-selling complaints, and enforcement's procedures result in naked short-selling complaints treated differently than other types of complaints. We are also currently working on several additional audit reports that we plan to issue in the upcoming months that address issues currently of concern to the Commission and the investing public, including a comprehensive analysis of the SEC's oversight of the credit reporting agencies, which may have played a critical role in the current economic crisis. We also have a vibrant and vigorous investigative unit that under my direction is conducting or has completed over 50 comprehensive investigations of allegations of violations, statutes, rules, and regulations, and other misconduct. These investigative reports have been issued without management influence or pressure and have focused on all levels of employees, including <coughs> senior SEC staff. In addition, we are currently conducting a comprehensive investigation and evaluation of matters related to Bernard Madoff and affiliated entities. In late December 2008, former SEC Chairman Chris Cox contacted me and asked my office to undertake an investigation into complaints received by the SEC regarding Mr. Madoff, going back 10 years, and the reasons why the agency found these complaints lack credibility. At that time, we've been working at a rapid pace to perform this important work and have made substantial progress to date. We have determined that the matters that must be analyzed regarding the Madoff investigation go well beyond the specific issues that former Chairman Cox asked us to investigate. Therefore, our oversight efforts will include an evaluation of broader issues regarding the overall operations of the SEC. We intend to provide overarching and comprehensive recommendations to ensure that the SEC is able to fulfill its mission. In order to strengthen the oversight of federal financial regulatory structure as a whole, my office works in tandem with other federal financial regulatory IGs to provide coordinated oversight. For example, I currently serve on the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, Inspector General Counsel, along with the Special IG from the TARP and IGs from several financial regulatory agencies, as well as the GAO, which meet to discuss coordination of TARP-related activities and oversight efforts. I also meet separately every month with additional federal financial regulatory IGs to discuss coordinated oversight efforts among the financial regulatory IG community. I greatly appreciate the subcommittee's interest in assisting the IGs in performing their critical work. The recently enacted amendments to the Inspector General Act made great strides in enhancing Inspector General independence and ensuring that the Inspectors General receive sufficient appropriated funds to achieve their mission. The improvements in this legislation include the requiring of advance notice to Congress of the removal of an IG, as well as provisions establishing pay parity on the part of both presidentially appointed and designated federal entity, DFE IGs. Since I began my tenure as Inspector General of the SEC in December 2007, my office's staffing levels have increased by nearly 80 percent, and I have requested an increase of our overall budget of nearly 30 percent for fiscal year 2009, which I understand will be processed as soon as the funds become available. Notwithstanding these increases, additional resources would greatly assist my office in continuing its important work. I specifically suggest that the, to the extent Congress provides additional appropriations to agencies, such as the SEC, for increased enforcement efforts, there be a commensurate and proportionate the corresponding Office of Inspector General to provide for oversight of the additional funds allotted to the agency. Additionally, the legislation recently passed by the Senate to provide the Special Inspector General for the TARP, or SIGTARP, with additional authorities and responsibilities is illustrative of measures that may be enacted to enhance Inspector General independence and effectiveness. For example, the SIGTARP legislation requires the Secretary of the Treasury to take action to address deficiencies identified by a report or investigation of the SIGTARP or to certify to the appropriate committees of Congress that no action is necessary or appropriate. 
Finally, I respectfully offer my opinion that converting IGs from DFE to presidentially appointed is not necessary and in my view would not improve the current level of DFE IG oversight. Having been an Inspector General at two DFEs, at the Peace Corps and now at the SEC, I can state without any hesitation that one can be a completely independent and effective Inspector General within the DFE structure. Although I have issued numerous reports at both agencies that have been of those agencies' operations and management, no one has ever attempted to impair or question my independence. In my personal situation at the SEC, my office's reports and approach to oversight have not diminished in any way with the recent change in administration or appointment of a new SEC chairman. I can report that politics play absolutely no role in my office's decisions. For this reason, I do have some concerns that converting the Inspector General of the SEC or the IGs of other financial regulatory agencies from DFE to presidentially appointed IGs could result in unnecessarily politicizing the Office of Inspector General. There are additional potential drawbacks to the presidentially appointed IG process, including the often lengthy vetting and confirmation process that may lead to the IG position being vacant for a significant period of time. During this time of financial crisis, it is more important than ever that there is continuity of the operations and oversight activities currently undertaken by IGs of financial regulatory agencies. In conclusion, I greatly appreciate the subcommittee's interest in the SEC and my office. I believe that the subcommittee and Congress's involvement with the SEC is extremely important to strengthen the accountability and effectiveness of the Commission. Thank you. When we were referring to complaints that you were receiving, and uh, for, I guess whistleblowers, people on staff, and so on, and you said they lacked credibility. Now, did I hear you correctly? And would you expand and explain what you said about the credibility? Sure. It, it, it's in connection with the Madoff investigation. Yeah. That what we are investigating in the Bernard Madoff investigation is why is it that the SEC, not our office, but that the SEC Enforcement Division received complaints. There was one whistleblower, Harry Markopoulos, who came forward with a complaint stating that he believed that Bernard Madoff was engaged in illegal activity. That complaint went to the SEC, didn't go to the IG's office, went to the SEC. And um, obviously the SEC did not uh, find that there was a scheme because that did not come out until Bernard Madoff um, confessed on December 11th. So our investigation is to look at why it was that the SEC received these complaints and nevertheless were unable to find the Ponzi scheme. And that was the concern about credibility that the chairman came from the SEC. Yes. Not from, okay. Right. I just wanted right. to place it where it should be. Yes. Yes. Thank oh, you. Right. We'll Thank now you. Uh, proceed uh, to Mr. Discerno. Chairwoman uh, Watson and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate this opportunity to come before you today and testify on matters concerning the independence and authority of designated federal entity inspectors general, including HR 885. I thank you for calling this hearing and for your support of the IG community. My name is William DeSarno, Inspector General of the National Credit Union Administration, whose primary mission is to ensure the safety and soundness of federally insured credit unions. I was appointed to the IG position at NCU in 2005 after having served since 1997 as Assistant IG for Audits and then Deputy IG at NCUA. Previously, I was an Audit Manager at the Department of the Treasury Office of Inspector General and before that, an audit manager at what is now the Government Accountability Office. Finally, I began my federal career 41 years ago in the United States Army, where I served in Vietnam. The NCUA board appointed its first IG in 1989 in the wake of the 1988 amendments to the IG Act of 1978, which created statutory IGs at smaller federal entities. The NCUA board and the OIG have worked hard over this 20-year period to establish a relationship built on mutual respect and trust. H.R. 885 would amend the IG Act to make the IG at the NCUA an establishment IG appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. I do not believe that this change in the IG status at NCUA would enhance either the independence or the effectiveness of the IG. Rather, I think it would work to the detriment of the IG role at NCUA. My independence as IG at NCUA has not been hampered because I was appointed by the NCUA board. To the contrary, the board has never attempted to interfere with an IG audit or investigation. 
Indeed, the NCOA board has consistently expressed high expectations for oversight, stated its intolerance of fraud and abuse, and paid close attention to IG findings. The NCUA OIG, while small, has historically been adequately staffed and with adequate resources to carry out its statutory obligations. My office formulates its own budget and has a separate line item in the agency's budget. The NCUA board has consistently supported my staffing needs. The NCUA IG has had its own counsel since 1990 who reports exclusively to the Inspector General. The NCUA board has also consistently approved funding for contract help when I have requested it. And let me also add that our audit and investigation reports are in no way filtered through either the board or the chairman's office prior to, uh, prior to issuance. Prior to the enactment of the IG Reform Act, the only area where the NCUA IG did not enjoy similar stature with other senior managers at NCUA was in the area of pay, where the IG was paid significantly less than other NCUA senior staff. This situation was further exacerbated because the IG did not accept bonuses or cash awards as other NCOA senior managers regularly did. With the agency's implementation of the IG Reform Act's pay provisions, the IG salary was elevated to the average of the other senior managers and the pay disparity was resolved. Were HR 885 to pass, the presidentially appointed IG's pay would be significantly less than the average total compensation of NCUA's senior level managers. Moreover, a presidentially appointed NCUA IG could end up with an annual salary less than some of his or her, or her subordinates in the OIG. This is precisely the outcome the IG Reform Act of 2008 sought to and did correct. Due to the current challenges facing the entire financial services industry, the NCUA OIG has a critical role in its oversight and accountability functions. For example, my office has seen a growing material loss review workload in the past year. This work is mandated by the Federal Credit Union Act, and the OIG currently has an unprecedented number of reviews either underway or in the planning process. We have redirected most of our audit resources to this review work. Were a presidential appointee to replace an IG who is familiar with the unique nature of the credit union industry, as well as the day-to-day -day functioning of an IG office, the potential disruption to OIG operations in completing this critical work would, I believe, be significant. A final concern I have should HR 885 change the appointment status of DFE IGs <laughs> is that the selection process risks politicization, which would significantly threaten IG independence. Congress required that IGs be nonpartisan, and the President appoint them without regard to political affiliation. In the 20 years that the IG concept has existed at NCUA, the NCUA board has never appointed an IG on the basis of political affiliation. In conclusion, while I do not speak for the NCUA board or the other DFE IGs, I do not believe that HR 885 would enhance the independence already afforded the NCUA IG. With the greater protections and enhanced independence afforded IGs by the IG Reform Act of 2008, the NCUA IG is well suited to carry out the responsibilities mandated by the Act. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> you made me a compliment. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate, as the others do, the opportunity to come before you all and uh, give our view of the uh, legislation and um, we think is uh, appropriately happening. Uh, and again, um, I will stand ready for questions. I don't think, given the time and so on, I will uh, regurgitate my statement here. But let me just concentrate on a couple of things. One is the independence issue, and okay, I can only speak for my own agency, not for the others. But, for example, um, some time ago, we investigated the chairman of our agency because there was a question of whether she had replaced someone at the behest of the White House or whether it was because of her own feelings about the situation. Someone who um, we found was not. She just didn't like the head of the enforcement. But that shows you that we certainly were independent. I will give her much credit. She is now um, Mr. Kotz's boss, in a sense. She's now chairman of the SEC. Very um, good person. We also more recently looked in at the behest of four senators the question of the uh, huge price increase for barrels of oil this last July 
and, and in what was called an interim report issued by CFT uh, staff and staff from other economic regulatory agencies. And what we found there is that, in fact, there had been a change in classification uh, of one of the large oil companies f from part of their um, into a, what's called speculative, and that's a bad word these days. I'm not so sure it should always be bad, but it is. And at least it should be explained readily what was going on. Uh, it, we found that the agency had reclassified appropriately. The problem was that unless you were an expert in the field, someone was constantly in it, you would not have understood the push and the shove of that. And we noted that in our report to uh, the four senators, that there had been an inadequate explanation I cite this again as an indication of independence. Uh, this was uh, involving the chairman, not just of the CFTC, but other entities. The other thing I would say is about 885. Uh, there's an old cliche, you, pay, you get what you pay for, and that's not always true. We had a chairman just prior to that who was willing to take the pay salary because he would made a hell of a lot of money in the investment banking business. You can find that, but there are those of us who um, haven't and have kids in college and so on, pay is a big consideration. I can tell you in my agency, and I think it's true of others, but I'll let them speak themselves, uh, and I can be objective about this because I'm of such an age, I probably won't be around for more than another year or two, but my pay would be decreased on the order of about uh, $40,000 a year. Uh, if that's, and that's relative to the other people at the CFTC. Now, if that's Congress as well, that's fine. I mean, that's, uh, well, you, your responsibility, but it seems to me, um, as you might guess, given my bias, perverse. If you want to have good people, generally you have to pay for it. And I think uh, cutting someone's salary 40000 and again, I can be semi-objective because I don't plan to be around much longer. But I think that's something you ought to really think about and uh, then make your decision. That's all I really have to say. If you have any questions, uh, whatever, it'll be fine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Chairwoman Watson and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to comment on proposed changes affecting offices of inspectors general in HR 885. In particular, my testimony will focus on differences between the IGs located in federal establishments and IGs located in the designated federal entities. DFE IGs are typically found in the smaller agencies. Establishment and designated federal entity IGs differ in terms of their remove, removal, appointment, transfer, budgets, applicable hiring laws, avenues for seeking legal counsel, and pay. The most notable difference between establishment IGs and the designated federal entity IGs is the individual who appoints and who may remove or transfer the IG. Establishment IGs are appointed by the President, as you know, with the advice and consent of the Senate. They may be removed or transferred only by the President, of impeachment. Designated federal entity IGs are appointed and may be removed or transferred by the agency head, except in the case of impeachment. My written statement discusses the potential advantages and disadvantages of converting these five IGs into presidentially appointed Senate confirmed positions. Another difference between the establishment IGs and the designated federal entity IGs is that by statute, establishment IGs receive a, step, a separate appropriations account or a line item in the establishment's appropriations. The Inspector General Reform Act of 2008 has increased and created additional safeguards in terms of the budgets of both establishment and designated federal entity IGs. The IG Reform Act requires the IG to report an initial budget estimate to the head of the agency. The agency head must then include this information, as well as comments of the Inspector General when transmitting the request to the President. The President, in turn, must then include an in his budget submission, the IG's initial budget estimate, the President's requested amounts, and the comments of the affected IG, if the IG determines that the President's budget would substantially inhibit the IG from performing his or her duties. The two types of IGs also differ in terms of how they may select their own employees. DFE IGs, the Designated Federal Entity IGs, are exempt from the sections of the IG Act and have always been since their creation in 1988. Um, from the sections that mandate the selection, appointment, and employment of officers and employees in the establishment IG offices according to civil service employment laws. And that's because, um, as Congress indicated in a House report back in 1988, um, some of these entities do not um, have to follow those laws and are subject to different laws and regulations. 
Establishment DFEIGs also differ in their ability to hire counsel or seek legal advice. The, and these um, changes were created in the IG Reform Act of 2008, which addressed the use of legal counsel by the IG and specified that an establishment IG must seek legal advice from an attorney who they hire under civil service laws and who reports directly to that IG or to another IG. The Reform Act also provided three ways for a designated federal entity IG to obtain counsel. First, the designated federal entity IG could obtain counsel from an attorney appointed by that IG in accordance with the specific laws and regulations governing appointments in the agency within the designated federal entity. This counsel would report directly to the appointing IG. Second, the designated federal entity IGs on a reimbursable basis could obtain services from a counsel who is appointed by and who reports to another inspector general. Third, the designated federal entity IG may obtain the legal services of an appropriate person on the newly created Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. The IG Reform Act of 2008 also continued pre-existing differences between establishment and designated federal entity IGs. For example, the Reform Act increased the pay of the establishment IGs to the rate of level three of the executive schedule plus 3%. And currently, level three of the executive schedule is $126,900. Um, however, it uh, included a provision which um, would allow the IGs who currently uh, received higher pay to continue at that level. The IG Reform Act also increased the pay of designated federal entity IGs, but did not link them to the executive schedule. Some designated federal entity IGs may make more than their establishment IG counterparts. The IG Reform Act also provided that designated federal entity IGs should be classified for pay purposes <coughs> at a level at or above the majority of the senior level executives of the designated federal entity IG, such as a general counsel or a chief financial officer, but that their pay could not be less than the average total compensation, including bonuses of those senior level executives. The Reform Act also provided that the designated federal entity IG's pay could not increase by more than 25% of the designated federal entity IG's average total pay for the previous three fiscal years. Madam Chairwoman, that concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to answer questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Burrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for calling this very important hearing. I commend you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, we learning the hard way because of the economic crisis that we're in the midst of, the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression, yet again, the importance of vigorous oversight and aggressive regulation. And it is absolutely critical to oversight that we have independent inspectors general. As you see from my prepared remarks, I've made four recommendations that in my judgment would make inspectors general more independent and therefore give them a greater incentive to be aggressive in exercising the oversight responsibilities that they've been given. The first one goes, of course, to the very heart of the legislation that we're considering, and that is I strongly believe, as you do, that uh, all of the inspectors general in the federal system, and especially the inspectors general of these critical uh, financial regulatory agencies, the Federal Reserve Board, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the CFTC, be presidentially appointed. It simply stands to reason, as Mr. Keplinger said, it's a matter of logic that an IG is more likely to stand up to an agency head if there's a disagreement between the agency head and the as to a particular audit or investigation if ultimately the inspector general cannot be removed by that agency head. I do not know Messrs. Cotts, DeSarno, and Lavic. They are all, I'm sure, fine gentlemen. I take them at their word when they say that they themselves have been independent in the, dis in the discharge of their responsibilities. I take them at their word when they say that their respective agency heads and boards, as the case may be, have never interfered with their work. But that is beside the point. The point is I'm concerned about their successors and whether their successors likewise have the impeccable character and, re and reputation and ability to stand up to pressure that they have. We, don't, we shouldn't make it harder for inspectors general to stand up to agency heads. We should make it easier. And it simply is a matter of logic, as I say. I think it's noteworthy, for example, that Mr. Kotz's statement, he began essentially by saying the, the testimony I'm about to give is, is my own testimony, that of the Office of Inspector General and not the SEC. There'd be no reason to say that if uh, he were an appointee of the president. 
think that any remarks that he would make in a forum like this would be those of the SEC. The second recommendation that I would have is that the uh, that Inspector General, like the FBI Director, as Mr. Keplinger noted, and I would note that another example, he could not think of one during his testimony, but another example, of course, is the Fed Chairman. The Fed Chairman, which of course is exactly relevant here, likewise has a fixed term, not term limits, but a fixed term. And the reason for that, of course, is that these two um, these two officials are intended to be independent from presidential administrations. Though they're appointed by a president, this fixed term uh, is intended to insulate them to the maximum extent possible. It matters less to me exactly what the term is. It's more important that they be a term. Uh, it would be most helpful if the term were to be long enough to span presidential terms. And in the case of the FBI director, seven years. I would note also, of course, the Controller General uh, has a 15-year term, and that is intended to insulate the Controller General from pressure from the from the administration and also from the Congress. Third, of course, inspectors general are human beings, and therefore they're fallible like everybody else. So on occasion, an inspector general should be removed for for from office. But inspectors general should be removed only for abusing their office, not simply for doing their jobs. An aggressive IG will occasionally, as I say, rub his or her agency head and the incumbent administration the wrong way. But that is not cause for removal. At president, at present, a president need only notify Congress in writing 30 days before he removes an IG that he is doing so and why, with any reason given being reason enough. I think that presidents should uh, be required uh, to uh, to should have the ability to remove an IG only for cause that is spelled out in a statute. That is another recommendation I would make. And then fourth, no one to date has mentioned this, but there are provisions in certain inspectors general statutes, uh, inspectors general who are appointed by the president, that even there limits the ability of the inspector general to carry out certain audits. In particular, there's a provision in the statute for the Treasury IG that allows the Treasury Secretary to prevent uh, an Inspector General from accessing sensitive information concerning deliberations and decisions on policy matters, the disclosure of which could reasonably be expected to have significant influence on the economy or market behavior. As I say in my statement, it is easy to imagine uh, a situation in which a Treasury Secretary could prevent an IG from looking at policies with regard to things like uh, years ago subprime mortgage lending and the variety of exotic financial instruments that lie at the heart of the present crisis. So I think that that we should look at all of the statutes that pertain specifically to a, to a given inspector general and remove those provisions that allow the agency head, even in those circumstances where at present an inspector general is appointed by the president, that allows the agency head to prevent an inspector general from looking at a particular matter either on the grounds of affecting market conditions or on national security grounds. There are like provisions in certain statutes of security inspectors general. Finally, the greater the amount of money and the greater the complexity of programs an inspector general has to oversee, the greater should be the resources given to the Office of Inspector General. So I hope very much that efforts will be made to significantly increase the budgets of all of the financial regulatory inspectors general during this critical time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you. Uh, we can now proceed uh, to Ms. Bryan. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman, uh, for inviting me to discuss one of my favorite topics, the Federal Inspector General System. Over the past year and a half, POGO has been investigating both the independence and accountability of that system. Last week, we released our second report on IGs. Our first report, which was released last year, focused specifically on weaknesses that we believe hampered some of the IG's independence and recommended some necessary changes to the law. The IG Reform Act of 2008, with the terrific leadership from Congressman Cooper and Senator Maskell, included most of the improvements we believe were needed to enhance IG independence. Since that time, the POGO has been examining the other side of that essential equation for inspectors general, which is accountability, and we've provided copies of our report to you today. Holding IGs accountable is a job that needs also to be embraced more thoughtfully by the Congress and accomplished more effectively by their peers through the IG Council's Integrity Committee. But the IG system is not broken. However, POGO urges the IG community to review its priorities. 
The most troubling finding we found in our most recent report is that IGs all too often treat those complainants or whistleblowers who come to them with problems in, in their agencies as mere afterthoughts. I need to point out this is not a specific concern regarding the IGs who I share the table with, but to, to answer your wonderful question, Madam Chairwoman of the earlier panel, uh, I, would, I would strongly suggest that at this point federal employees do not have adequate uh, whistleblower protections, and that is a, no fault of the House. The House has regularly stalwart in insisting that uh, federal employees have better whistleblower protections. Our problem has been that the Senate has not um, accepted the strong recommendations from the House on that matter. So they remain very underprotected, we believe. But as our country reels from the economic crisis, we are relying more on the IGs, not only to detect and deter the misuse of public funds, but to help restore confidence in our government's operations. I believe H.R. 885 has been offered in that spirit in order to provide IGs of the financial regulatory agencies independence that they require, but I would respectfully suggest that the tools given IGs in last year's legislation largely accomplish that goal. And I did want to, uh, to react to some of the earlier testimony and, and offer a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, one thing is that IGs whose behavior has caused concerns about their independence uh, have far more often actually been presidential appointees. Two that were specifically noted before were that of NASA and Commerce. Those were presidentially appointees. Uh, I was also very concerned about uh, the discussion of the use of numbers of audits or investigations as a measure of effectiveness of uh, DFE IGs as opposed to presidentially appointed IGs. That's a big part of the point of the report that we've offered to you, is we, we don't believe it's it's a good way to measure the quality of work of an IG is to measure by numbers the number of investigations or audits they complete. I've learned that you can double the number of audits by cutting in half the subject matter of the audits and, um, and then suddenly you have double the number of audits. That's not a, a useful measure for uh, measuring the quality of an IG. It also didn't uh, recognize that over half the DFE offices uh, IG offices only have a total of six people. So to, it, it's important to keep in perspective how many of those DFE offices are just absolutely tiny. I must admit that uh, I began, when I began focusing on the IG system over a year ago, I shared the perception that underlies HR 885, the DFE IGs are somehow less independent because they're appointed by their agency heads rather than the president. I have come to appreciate that in some cases, there is some logic to the DFE structure, especially for those agencies that are headed by a multi-person commission or board, generally uh, uh, filled with bipartisan appointments rather than having a single agency head. So it may in fact be the case that some DFE IGs, many of those are those that are being discussed in this legislation, uh, are actually more independent because as one IG put it to me, I would have to PO five people to be removed as a DFE, but as a presidential appointee, only one person would have to want me gone. My second reason for believing that H.R. 885, while very well intentioned, may be counterproductive is that which was discussed before with regards to the comparability pay structure because of these uniquely unusual pay structures for the financial regulatory agencies, and that would actually reverse a fix that had been accomplished through last year's legislation. Finally, while the legislation provides for the current IGs to remain in place until a presidential appointee is confirmed, this change would then undercut the current IGs' authority by making them acting at a time we would want these IGs to be confident they can be bold and protected even when they are the messengers of bad news. Congress should be applauded for turning to the IG's generals, I mean, to the inspectors generals, and worrying about whether they are able to be aggressive, the aggressive watchdogs we need. But if the goal of this legislation is to strengthen the important work of these IG's, I would suggest respectfully that we may be focusing on the wrong issue, and that making them presidential presidential appointments may merely be a distraction. I would suggest there are a few other changes that you might consider to enhance their roles. For example, most of these IGs are currently restricted from accessing information directly from the regulated entities. These IGs should have the capacity to subpoena both documents and testimony from the entities regulated by their agencies. A sec second valuable step forward, as mentioned earlier, would be to
The provision in the SIG-TARP legislation, which requires the head of an agency to certify to Congress whether they are implementing IG recommendations and to explain why if they are not. A third improvement would be to give IGs control over their approved budgets, which means not just that their budgets are more transparent, which was a very important improvement of last year, but DFEs still have trouble uh, making hiring and promotion decisions within those budgets. And that is a change that I think would be very important to accomplish. And finally, the OIGs we're talking about today have not benefited from the extra funds provided to their agencies that have received stimulus funds. Increasing the resources available to these IGs commensurate with the new expectations of their offices would be another real way of helping them do their work. So I applaud the Congress and I applaud you, Madam Chairwoman, and the subcommittee for turning your attention to this very important issue. And I look forward to working with the subcommittee as it uh, endeavors to make sure the IGs are all they can be. I want to thank all of the panelists, and uh, I really appreciate uh, your patience and coming up with uh, something we can dig into. Uh, Ms. Bryan, I was uh, quite interested in your final remarks. You are an independent private agency, right? Nonprofit, yes, ma'am. Nonprofit. Ma yes, ma'am. And I think you stated that information could not be shared with your, I guess, investigators and so on. Would you clarify that for me? Well, I wasn't talking about my own. I was just, I was talking, uh, speaking to the IG's access. Yes. Currently, their capacity is to uh, gather information, and it actually changes slightly agency by agency, so you might ask my, uh, my colleagues here about their particular agency, but a number of those in question have the capacity to look at what their agency has collected, but can't reach out to the bank or the financial institution and subpoena documents, and they can't subpoena any testimony from anybody uh, currently, and that's the kind of capacity I think which could be really very valuable. Let me go back to Mr. Kotz. Uh, do you find it very difficult to go into those lending agencies and get information? What well, are the I'm, hurdles and challenges that you face? Yeah, I mean, I do, I, I do agree with those remarks that if we had the ability to subpoena individual testimony of uh, lending agencies, of investment banks, of institutions that are regulated by the SEC, that would be very helpful in op our operations. Uh, right now, uh, we can subpoena documents, but not testimony. We can subpoena testimony of SEC individuals, but not testimony of other folks. So we wanted to take the testimony of the uh, general counsel of a large uh, bank, and um, we were able to do it, but he would not submit to being under oath because we don't have the power to subpoena uh, the testimony in that manner. So I would suggest that that's a, a very good uh, suggestion to improve our ability to do our job. Well, you know, I'm stunned by the response that you cannot get all the information you need to do a credible job. And so with subpoena power, you think that would be possible? Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Mr. DeSarno, would you like to speak to that concern? Well, I, I would echo the, the comments from uh, uh, David Cox. Uh, I, I, at NCUA, we have never had a problem in getting information because we, if we need information, either records or documents from the credit unions that NCUA supervises, we would go through the NCUA staff, the, examin the examination staff, uh, to get those documents. And they had, they, of course, the agency has the authority to get those documents for us from the regulated uh, credit unions. And we've been successful in every uh, instance we, we've ever had, so we've never had to use any subpoena authority. But, uh, but David is correct that uh, while we could, if we had to, subpoena records and documents from the credit unions, uh, I don't believe we have the authority to actually force testimony from the uh, uh, employees of those credit unions. Is there anyone else uh, on the panel that would have liked to address that concern? I, I would just say I always found it very strange in a, in a bifurcated manner that you can subpoena documents uh, but not uh, witness testimony. And I think it goes back to someone I uh, met at a conference, a congressman from Texas, and he uh, explained to me he just didn't trust us enough. He's no longer there. Very good fellow, by the way. Let me hasten to add. <laughs> Is it like taking the fifth? Yeah, know, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do not understand 
how an individual who has other people's money in their hands made off was able to get away with it this long. What happened? Where did the system break down? I understand he did his own accounting, mm -hmm. or, yeah. all of his own paperwork. Mm -hmm. And you know, we talk about it here as cooking the books. Yep. How in the world, I know there's a Ponzi scheme, could, with the SEC, how in the world could he get away with it that long? I have people in my district that lost hundreds of millions of dollars through him. How in the world could he get away with that? Anybody dare to give uh, their idea of how he was able to carry on in this way? You know, I, I can only say oversight that, and I, I can only say that, that we will have that answer. We're working on a report of how Please. the SEC let it happen, mm -hmm. and we will have an answer to all those questions. Um, and it will be a report that you know, as appropriate, will be very critical of SEC, uh, you know, as, as an independent IG can do. So uh, we will get to the bottom of it from the SEC perspective, that I can assure you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, when do you expect you will be able to get to the bottom? We think we'll have a report by the end of the summer. It'll be a comprehensive report of all the different complaints that came into the SEC going back many years all the different examinations and investigations that the SEC conducted and how it went wrong. Well, I'm going to uh, request of my staff that uh, when that report is made public or given to uh, Congress, that we hold another hearing and let you go through it and have people to comment on it. Thank you, absolutely. Now, uh, I'd like to continue to address areas of concern, and I'd like to talk about the legal authorities of the IG and whether the IGs at our financial regulatory agencies have adequate law enforcement. We've already talked about the subpoena power, but uh, is there anything else that you think would be necessary legally?